Whenever the study of literature comes up in popular culture, the talk is often about the difficulty, sometimes the absurdity, of literary interpretation. The idea is that literary scholars spend a lot of time trying to figure out what individual works mean. And especially in popular culture, literary scholars are often portrayed as looking too hard for those meanings, trying to read into an otherwise straightforward work some kind of bizarre interpretation that's not really there. I want to talk about literary interpretation in this lecture, what it is, how we do it, etc. But I also want to point out that literary interpretation is actually only a small part of literary scholarship. A large number of literary works, frankly, don't need much interpretation, or at least the kind of interpretation I'm talking about here. A lot of literary works have a very clear and straightforward meaning. Take a poem like Tinner and Abbey, for example. While you may have had a hard time understanding that poem, your difficulty almost certainly was due just to the language that Wordsworth used, and the normal difficulty of reading a poem, since words and phrases aren't always in the clearest order. But I don't think Wordsworth intended his poem to be difficult to understand, or that it has some sort of hidden meaning, and I'll talk more on that term in a minute. Wordsworth comes right out and tells us what he's talking about in the poem. So what we do when we study a poem like Tinner and Abbey isn't really interpretation, at least in the common sense of that term. Instead, we study the poem's historical and biographical context. Maybe we look at Wordsworth's influences or why he used certain words and phrases. But we're not really trying to figure out what the poem means. Now, with a poem like Goblin Market, the situation is obviously more complicated. This is a very strange poem, filled with goblins and curses, magic fruit, and some pretty questionable imagery that I promise we're going to talk about. It's sort of crying out for interpretation, partly because the interpretation that the poem itself seems to offer is pretty unsatisfying for many readers. The last six lines of the poem seem to confer some kind of meaning when the narrator says, for there is no friend like a sister in calm or stormy weather to cheer one on the tedious way, to fetch one if one goes astray, to lift one if one totters down, to strengthen whilst one stands. And, I mean, okay, there's no friend like a sister is a nice kind of moral for the poem, I guess, and the poem is about sisters, but the idea of Rossetti writing this very odd poem about goblins just to make the point that it's nice to have a sister doesn't ring very true. Or, maybe more importantly, it hasn't rung very true for critics of the poem and for other readers of the poem. Critics have written a lot about this poem and come up with a lot of very different ideas about the poem's meaning. I want to talk about a few of these interpretations and then talk about the idea of interpretation in general and how we should think about these different critics' ideas. One of the more popular ways to interpret Goblin Market, especially early in the history of criticism of the poem, is as a kind of religious allegory. This kind of reading may actually have occurred to some of you as you read the poem. There have been quite a few studies published which approach it in this way, but most of them can trace their lineage back to a 1956 article by Marion Schalkhauser called The Feminine Christ. In this interpretation, the goblin men are representative of sin. Laura, the sister who gives in to the goblin calls, is similar to Adam and Eve, who give in to the temptation of Satan in the Garden of Eden and end up losing their souls. Notice that in both cases, fruit is the vehicle of the temptation. Lizzie, in this reading, is a symbol of Christ, willing to sacrifice herself, specifically by taking on some of the stain of sin in the form of the fruit juice, in order to offer salvation to Laura, which is where Schalkhauser takes the title of her article. According to this interpretation, then, those closing lines about the way a sister can cheer you, can lift you up and strengthen you, are really about the relationship between Christians and Christ. Now, Schalkhauser's article has influenced generations of critics who have written further religious interpretations of the poem. But that's certainly not to say that all critics have read the poem in that way. And in fact, the religious symbolism in the poem may not have been the element that jumped out at you on first reading. For a lot of readers, the first thought they have about Goblin Market is that this is a poem about sex. Some of the imagery in the poem seems to push hard in that direction, so hard, in fact, that it becomes difficult to ignore. When Lizzie tells Laura to 
Come and kiss me, never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices, squeezed from goblin fruits for you, goblin pulp and goblin dew. Eat me, drink me, love me, Laura, make much of me. Well, it's hard not to raise an eyebrow at lines like that, isn't it? And quite a few critics have focused on this aspect of the poem, writing interpretations that emphasize the poem's interest in sexuality. In an article from 1979 by Martine Watson Brownlee, titled Love and Sensuality in Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market, the author argues that the poem is a parable about female initiation into the world of adult sexuality. The goblins represent male sexuality, which again is typified in the fruit that they offer to the young girls. It's worth remembering here that fruits are essentially sexual organs. They're how some plants reproduce by spreading seeds. And fruit has long been used as a sexual metaphor in art and literature, again going back to the Garden of Eden. As a side note, many biblical scholars consider that story to be about sexual temptation specifically. I mean, fruits are sexual, the serpent is sort of a phallic shape, the result of eating the fruit is an immediate recognition and shame on the part of Adam and Eve about their nakedness, Eve is punished by suffering pain in childbirth. I mean, you get the point. Brownlee suggests that Goblin Market is about the way Laura is tempted into the world of what she calls an immature, self-centered sexuality, only to be saved by her sister, who represents a different kind of sexuality based on real love and connection with another person. Now, it's worth noting here that Brownlee is not suggesting that the poem is about incest or even necessarily about lesbianism. For her, the sexuality expressed between Laura and Lizzie is entirely metaphorical. I should point out, however, that many other critics have addressed the scenes in the poem more literally and more explicitly, arguing that there is no friend like a sister is really an endorsement of same-sex female love, and arguing that the scene in which the goblins attack Lizzie is essentially a rape scene. And frankly, when we're told that the goblins tore her gown and soiled her stocking, twitched her hair out by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat, it's hard, it's not hard, rather, to see why some critics have interpreted the poem in that way. You may, however, be a little more surprised about the direction that interpretations of the poem have taken in more recent years. While some critics are still writing about the poem's religious and sexual themes, many articles in the past 20 years have focused on more economic interpretations of the poem. These critics tend to focus on the goblin's repeated call to come by, come by. One interesting approach to the poem is found in Herbert Tucker's 2003 article, Rossetti's Goblin Marketing, Sweet to Tongue and Sound to Eye. For Tucker, the poem is about the way the goblins use language to seduce the young girls not into sex, but into buying their products. In other words, the poem is about advertising, which was a relatively new phenomenon in the Victorian era. According to Tucker, Laura is a sucker who will never get an even break because no actual commodity can match the consuming appetite that her susceptibility to strong marketing has awakened. Lizzie, on the other hand, represents a more sophisticated kind of shopper. She's willing to buy the fruit and to pay what she considers a fair price for it, but she sees through the goblin's marketing ploys, she sees the true value of, of the fruit and its dangers more clearly than her sister. Now, that may be an approach to the poem that you hadn't thought about, but I'd point out that the title of the poem, Goblin Market, clearly signals that the economic exchange is a point of interest in the poem at the very least. Okay, so I know what some of you are thinking right now. Some of you want to know which of these interpretations is the right one. And my answer to that question is probably not going to satisfy you. It's not going to make you happy. But it's a really important answer because it gets to the heart of what literary interpretation, literary analysis, is really about. Because I don't think that any of these interpretations is right. And it's not because there's anything wrong with the interpretations themselves, but because I don't think that the right interpretation exists I don't think that's a productive way of thinking about interpretation in the first place. A lot of students, a lot of readers, a lot of people think that the point of literary interpretation, 
is to figure out what the author meant when writing the work in question. To be fair, for a significant part of literary history, that's also the way a lot of literary critics approach the idea of interpretation. But I think you'd be hard-pressed to find many literary critics today who would endorse that definition of interpretation. There are a few problems with treating interpretation as a search for what was inside the author's head when he or she was writing a specific literary work. For one, there's a practical problem, which is that in almost every case, we'll never know what the author intended. Christina Rossetti has been dead for over 125 years. She didn't leave any key to the poem or like notes about what she meant when she was writing it. And so if our goal is to try to figure out what she was thinking or what her intentions were, I think we're always going to be unsatisfied because we will never be able to find out if one answer is the right answer or not. And even if she had written some kind of explanation of the poem, I think we're still faced with some problems. Are authors always truthful about their intentions, first of all? I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine the devoutly religious Rossetti in the 1850s and 60s writing a document saying that this poem is about the joys of lesbian sexuality, for example. For that matter, maybe the author isn't always aware of their own intentions. We haven't talked about Freud yet. We'll get to him later in the course. But Freud and most modern psychologists would argue that we're not always aware of the reasons behind our own thoughts and actions. But mostly, I think the idea of literary interpretation as the search for authorial intent is just unsatisfying. I mean, think about it. If a hundred different articles were published about Goblin Market, each with at least a slightly different approach to the poem's meaning, at least 99 of them would have to be wrong if we think of interpretation in that way. It's a depressing approach to literary scholarship to suggest that our goal is to guess at some kind of true meaning, knowing that we'll probably get it wrong, and also knowing that we'll probably never find out if we were right or wrong. So most scholars today think about interpretation very differently. Rather than thinking of interpretation as the act of trying to find meaning, like we're on some kind of treasure hunt, instead they'll talk about interpretation as the art of making or constructing meaning. The implication in that term is pretty clear. Critics aren't limited to one true meaning. Rather, their job is to build an interesting and compelling interpretation out of the evidence at hand. As a result, it doesn't make sense to talk about an interpretation being right or wrong. Those terms just don't apply. But that doesn't mean that there are no boundaries or limits on interpretation. I've read lots of published interpretations of literature that I thought were complete nonsense. But the problem isn't that those interpretations are wrong about what the author intended. The problem is that they're not convincing because they don't account for the evidence of the text in a reasonable way. Think of it this way. If I gave you a pile of building materials, lumber, nails, sheetrock, etc., and told you to build a house out of those materials, there are probably a lot of different houses that you could build. But that doesn't mean that you could build absolutely any house out of those materials. The pile of materials that can build a two-bedroom, 1,500-square-foot wood frame house, for example, cannot build a 5,000-square-foot stone mansion. You're limited by the materials at hand. And the same holds true for literary interpretation. What makes an interpretation valid and convincing is how well it accounts for the evidence, mostly the evidence of the text itself, but also the evidence of historical and biographical context. The three interpretations of Goblin Market that I've presented in this lecture are all valid because they all rely heavily on the use of specific evidence both inside and outside the text. If someone tried to argue that the poem was about, I don't know, alien invasion and that the goblins are actually extraterrestrials, well, I'm not saying that it's impossible to build that interpretation out of the evidence we have, but I've read the poem many, many times and I don't see the evidence for that kind of reading. So that's where we are in terms of how we interpret a poem like this one. Our goal should always be to look closely at the evidence of the text and at outside contextual evidence if appropriate, and to come up with a way of thinking about the text that's interesting and convincing to readers, not one that we can present as the right answer. <laughs>
Oh, and if you can make it about sex, that's always a plus.